I'm going to show you how to create a simple orchestrator workflow. Let's get started. Hi everyone, I'm Brian Watchers from Vavork. If this is your first time here and you want to learn about automating, programming, and monitoring in VMware environments, you're in the right place. Start now by subscribing and click the bell so that you don't miss a thing. If you've been watching these videos in order, then you know what Orchestrator is, you know how to download it, you know how to deploy it, you know how to configure it, you even know how to log into it and run an Orchestrator workflow. But that's not what you came here to learn. You came here to learn how to create your own Orchestrator workflow. And that's what we're going to do in this video. So let's go head into the lab environment. As you can see, I've logged into the Vero client. If you don't know how to log into the Vero client, go back to the previous video where I talk about how to log into the Vero client. But here in the Vero client, as you can see, I am, let's actually expand the nav bar here. As you can see, I'm in the library workflow section and we have three different views for looking at workflows. I'm in the hierarchy view, which is typically for beginners, the easiest one to start with. And as you can see, I have the workflow folder called library, which is created automatically and it's chock full with lots of different workflows that VMware and third party partners have created. But as I uh, suggested in an earlier video, it's a great idea for you to create your own workflow folder, which I've done here, a folder called Vovork. If you haven't already started doing this, Go to the topmost workflow folder, choose new folder, and create yourself your own workflow folder. As you can see, my workflow folder called Vivork is currently empty. There's nothing in it. If I wanted to, I could create some subfolders. Um, ultimately, I will end up doing that because doing so will help me to organize my workflows. But for right now, I'm only going to have one workflow, so I don't need any subfolders. What I need to do is to create a new workflow. So I'm going to click on the new workflow button. The first thing I'm asked to do is to give a name for my workflow. And I'm going to choose the name Say Hello because what this terribly exciting workflow is going to do here, the workflow that we're about to write, is going to uh, implement the traditional computer programmer's first program, or in this case, it's a workflow. So what this workflow is going to do is simply say the phrase Hello World. Again, that's what we do traditionally in computers. So why, why, why fight tradition? So I'm going to name my workflow. Notice that in the names of workflows, you can, uh, it's totally allowed to put spaces in the names. It's totally allowed to have upper and lowercase characters. Uh, I might stick to alphanumerics. I generally try to stay away from punctuation uh, aside from space, but pick yourself a name for your workflow and click create. Next, you'll see we're in the editor, the workflow editor, and we have a number of different tabs, which we'll talk about as this, this video series unfolds. But for right now, we're on the summary tab, and you can see here the name of the workflow. If I ever want to change the name of the workflow, this is where I do so. Every workflow has both a name that you and I as human beings use to refer to the workflows, but Orchestrator itself has an internal ID that it uses um, as a separate, unique ID for each Orchestrator workflow. For right now, you don't have to worry about that ID. Later on, when we do fancier things, that ID will be essential. But for right now, it doesn't matter. As you can see here, uh, Orchestrator has a versioning mechanism, which we'll talk about in later videos. And additionally, you can tag workflows and other items in Orchestrator. Now, we're going to just simply type uh, a tag here. We'll call this tag hello. Nothing terribly fancy, and we're not actually going to use uh, the, the tagging mechanism right now other than to, to show that I can set a tag. And I'll show you how you can see it later, but how to make effective use of tags is a subject for a later video. In the meantime, uh, what else do we have here? So you can specify groups that have access to this workflow, but notice that here you can specify the workflow folder that you want the workflow stored in. Now, by virtue of having clicked the new workflow button while I was in the 
the work folder, that is going to make this the folder that the workflow shows up in by default. But if you want to, you could select another folder. We'll talk later on what it means to uh, handle server restarts and what it means to resume workflows. Again, we'll talk about that later. But I want to point out this super important field labeled description. Every workflow has a name and a description. You should always type a description for every single workflow that you ever create. So for instance, I'm going to type a brief description here of what this workflow is going to do. This workflow says, hello world. That's all it does. But I've taken the time to type that description because every workflow should have a description. Being a good orchestrator developer involves adopting certain habits right from the beginning, and one of which is setting good descriptions. All right, so having set the description and other values here on the summary tab, we could go to the variables tab and create some variables. We could create some inputs. We could create some outputs. We could do lots of different things, but in this simple example here, we're going to jump straight to the tab labeled schema. When we click on the schema tab, as you can see over on the, the left side of the, the screen, we have all these different icons, or I call them schema elements, and they're grouped into different sections. So for instance, right now we're looking at generic schema elements, but we also have network schema elements, logging schema elements, basic schema elements, and we'll talk about these as the video series unfolds. But for right now, the one that I want you to see is in the generic section. It's the very first one called the scriptable task. What a scriptable task allows you to do is to embed code into your orchestrator workflow. Now, before I actually do that, I want to be abundantly clear here that one of the things that is wonderful about orchestrator is that it minimizes the amount of code that you have to write. I can create an orchestrator workflow without writing any code whatsoever. Now, I'll show you examples of doing that, but to create this simple workflow, we're going to use a scriptable task. We are going to type a little bit of code. Don't worry, it's not that much. It won't be that painful. We are going to type a little bit of code to make this workflow actually do something. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag one of these scriptable tasks and deposit it here onto this uh, blue arrow. Let me scoop this here so you can see the blue arrow again. I'm going to deposit the new schema element on the blue arrow in between these other two schema elements. This is a start schema element. This is an end schema element. And the, obviously the start schema element is where the workflow is going to start and the end schema element is where it's going to end. That's why they call it the start and the end. And you can reposition your icons around if need be to make them look pretty. Uh, plus you can also right click and choose things like instead of arranging them horizontally, you can arrange them vertically. Totally up to you. I'll let you explore those, but I'm going to stick with the, the, the usual horizontal view. Every single schema element that you add has a label on it. Now I'm going to select that schema element and you can see that label showing up here once again. So scriptable task is the default label, but I'm going to change that label to something more descriptive. Uh, I'm going to set the label to say hello. And additionally, we have some other fields that we could set up, and we could set up something called inputs and outputs, and we could set up exception handling. We'll talk about all those things later on. But what we're going to do is jump to the scripting tab. Actually, forgot to point something out. Did you notice, by the way, when I changed the name field here, that that changed the label of the schema element? All right, now let's get back to the scripting tab. The scripting tab is where you will type your code. And notice that that code can be in JavaScript or other languages. Uh, those languages include PowerShell, Python, and Node.js. But for right now, for reasons I won't go into, our only choice right now is JavaScript. So we're going to go with that. Additionally, if you want to understand um, some of the, the, the objects in the code that we're going to be writing here, there's this thing called the API Explorer, which again, we'll talk about in a later video. But for right now, we're just going to write some JavaScript code. I'm going to type it, and then I'll explain to you what it's doing. 
There we go. There is our code. Again, you don't have to write code for an orchestrator workflow, but in this case, we are. This code is going to log a message, specifically the message, hello world, exclamation point. Now, the way this is being accomplished is by using a method. So in this case here, the method's called log, and that method is a member of an object called system. Notice that I typed capital S-Y-S-T-E-M. The object called system is spelled with a capital S. JavaScript is a case-sensitive language, so it's essential that if we tell you to type capital S-Y-S-T-E-M, you got to type the, the capitalization correctly. So system.log is a method that will log a message whatever message we put here in parentheses. So this string here, hello world, exclamation point is the message. JavaScript is a language in which lines are, or statements are terminated with a semicolon. That's why I typed a semicolon at the end of the line here. Now, as you create your scriptable task, you might want to periodically click this link here labeled validate. I'm gonna click validate and You'll notice it tells me in this, the case of this very simple workflow that there's no problems. The validation has been successful. On the other hand, if there were problems with this workflow that Orchestrator can detect, it will tell me what the problems are so that I can go find them and fix them. So since my workflow looks good, I could click save, go back to that hierarchy view of the workflows and run the workflow from there. But notice that I can run the workflow right here in the editor itself. So let's do that. I'm going to click run and notice that when it runs the workflow, it tells me first you must save it. So let's go ahead and save that workflow. Again, I could do the same thing by clicking the save button down in the lower left hand corner, but let's save the workflow and run it. This particular workflow has no input, so we're not going to see the usual screen that you would see, normally you'd see a window pop up asking you to answer some questions, answer some inputs. This workflow has none, so we don't see that window. Instead, what we see is we are looking at the workflow run, also known as a workflow token. We're looking at the workflow run for the, this specific instance of running this particular workflow. And we can tell from the highlighted um, of the end scheme element here that that's where we are in the workflow. We have successfully completed running the workflow. We're at the end. Now, when you look at these workflow runs, the general tab gives you general information about what's going on. Uh, by the way, this ID here looks like the workflow ID that we saw before, but this is actually a workflow run ID. A little bit different. We'll talk about the difference later on, but for right now, you can totally ignore that. But in the general tab, we can see when the workflow started. We can see uh, assuming it's done running, we can see when it ended, we can see what status it ended with, was it successful, completed means successful, failed means it failed, um, and there are other statuses. You can see who started it, and you can see the name of the workflow. But crucially, the next two tabs give us some insight into what happened. If I click the variables tab, I would be able to see variables, inputs, and outputs if I had defined them. But so far, we have not. So the variables tab here is blank. We'll get an opportunity in future videos to see the variables tab in action, but we will get to see the logs tab. In the logs tab, you can see timestamp entries for messages that have been logged. Here is the message that we logged using our JavaScript code. Now you'll notice that there are actually a couple of other logged messages here, the, the first one and the last one. Um, just to be really clear here, those two were added by Orchestrator itself. And when it says things like item one and item zero, let me go back to the workflow and show you exactly what they're talking about. When you see item number something. So I'm going to close the workflow run, which will take us back to our workflow. I'm going to go back to our schema. And in the schema tab, notice that we have these different schema elements including some of which have labels, like this say hello, but other schema elements don't. Notice that when you select a schema element, 
Over here, it tells you the item number for that schema element. Over here, item number zero is the one that we've been calling the in schema element. So the reason why I'm pointing this out to you is that when you see logging messages and the logging messages say item number something, that's what those messages are referring to. Now, a uh, quick little wrap up here. I'm going to close my workflow. And back on the main screen, I'll expand the navigation bar. Back on the main screen, we have been doing essentially everything that we've been doing in this video, we've done from the workflows tab. We did do a brief little uh, jaunt into what's known as the workflow runs section. So under activity workflow runs, Every time you run a workflow like we just did, a workflow run, also known as a workflow token, gets created. And you can uh, either look at the workflow run right when the workflow is running or any time after the fact. If you come back to activity workflow runs, you can see your earlier workflow runs. You can click a workflow run and it will take you back to that very same screen that I showed you a few moments ago. So there you have it. You have now created a simple vRealize Orchestrator workflow that happened to use a tiny bit of JavaScript code, but in later videos, we're going to show you how to create fancier Orchestrator workflows and how to create Orchestrator workflows that don't require any code at all. Join me in the next video where I'll introduce you to VRO inputs.